brother probably. Uh, yeah. I I just pray. Pray. yeah, thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Father, we are grateful for what you keep on doing in our lives. We are grateful for your mercies that are new every day that we face, Almighty God. You're the God of all creation, and in your design and your pattern, you saw it fit that Pastor Moni and us will be able to meet in class. And therefore, we pray that you will season us with your grace, you will season us with your oil, that we will have the understanding as we take in the knowledge tonight. <coughs> Sorry. Yes. May your name be glorified, may your name be exalted. We lift your name above all hells. Take us for yourself and for your glory. We commend tonight's session into your hands in Christ yes, Jesus. We've given thanks and pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Sean. Well, let's um let's just head on over to our classroom. Um, I'm gonna speak tonight about um a couple of things, as you know that from next week we will be doing life management one and january we will do life management two so we will we will come to a close for this year um with life management one and and i'll expect your um term papers for that as well as your exam filled by the the first week of january so you, you'll have a lot of time for that one but for this one we're gonna we're gonna close tonight with with this um, last session with um, helping people in crisis uh, and you know this is a, this is the deal we help people in crisis we help anybody who's in crisis no matter what their sexual orientation is we help them we, we we try to lead them to Christ we try to lead them to find a way to speak to their God to speak to the Lord God Almighty so yes obviously we'll we'll be compassionate about them so. During this, during tonight's session, I'll be just this, explaining to you some things about your assessment, and things I'll be expecting to see in the in the um, in the, in the term paper as well as in the um, the test. Well, but not what I'll be seeing because I've already completed the the test work um, for you, so that you just be able to to run that um, during the course of uh, maybe by next next weekend Tuesday. Uh, you'll be you'll need to be finished. Remember, when we start our next training, you'll that you'll have to be finished with your test before then. Um, but I, I know you've got this busy schedule, so I've I, I've I've been very lenient the past months or so to to still you know wait for some tests. So yes, um, obviously I'll I'll probably give you another grace um, for this month and this time of the year. Um, all of us we are pastors and we know. How busy things can get in church, so so I guess I can still give you for this for 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 helping people in crisis introduction to biblical counseling part two. I can also give you until um, maybe just before closing, before we close for the year. Because remember now we're going to close for the year roundabout. I think we have our last class the 13th of December. That's just before the before um, you know the, the holiday break. So we'll be we'll be closed. We won't have any sessions until the tenth of January. That is December break. So um, it's just to give you some time to 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 reflect, to you know, to go and read a little bit and and become human again because you've done great work. You've done exceptional work in class, and also some of you have done. All of you have done great in your in your term paper. So yes, um, you did well the past few weeks. Now we are on week four with BC 308, helping people in crisis, as you can see. And I wanted to remind you before we start that you, you should complete your um, reading with Christian um, Counseling or Theology of Christian Counseling by Jay Adams. By now you have to complete that because you'll have to put that book away from Monday, coming Monday, because we'll have a new course study, a course textbook, which I will give you on, well, I'll share with you soon um, on, when my professor gives it to me, but also... You'll, you'll have to think about the term paper because now this week is almost at a close. Well, at the start, but I mean, this month is almost at a close. But um, I'll give you some extension until about the 10th of December just to complete your um, term paper as well as your exam, please, so that you can just finish up that. And then also the homework assignments. Everybody did some homework. Um, and, and, and obviously, when you get homework, you, you have to do it because... 
uh, we, we are relying on your, um, your competence that you are a, um, a student of, of format. And obviously, um, I, I can trust you with that. Then also, so uh, all of you um, who have done level three uh, with the CSC, Community Services Chaplaincy, remember that that training will also um, accredit non-credit hours, class hours to you. It means that you've done level one, level two, and level three with the CSC. But this course for this month will give you at least three credit hours value um, towards your degree program, whichever degree program you're enrolled for. Now, um, so yes, what we're going to do tonight is, um, and, and this is not in your coursework, not at all. I've explained to my chancellor that I'm going to give you tonight some, some um hands-on stuff, things that can help you in your counseling ministry, things that can, can that can benefit you. And obviously, if you read that book, you know, The Theology of Counseling, um, then obviously you will find a lot of important information in there. I'm going to focus on psychology.com and also a little bit on Howard Kleinbell tonight. And I'm going to just give you some tactics how to, how to um, you know, do some expert counseling when you when you see your clients in your office because many times we as pastors and and also as as, as chaplains some of you are chaplains we we struggle to to get the breakthrough in, in the in the classroom or even in the in the in the in our offices but um we spoke about this before in our third week of training for this segment of the work and we said we need to give give some homework remember that we need to give some homework, and there's some requirements and expectations regarding homework. Um, it, it's not or no longer needed or useful, superfluous. Um, assigning between sessions, you need to give some homework for the people and for the couple. Let's use in a couple, um, a real, you know, a married, let's say a married couple um, for, for our framework for tonight and for tonight's session, and say, between the sessions, you need to give them something to go home with. They have to get homework. And I, and I know homework sounds a little bit daunting and it sounds a little bit frustrating because if they get homework, you also have to do homework before you enter into a session. Um, yes, and obviously this homework will contribute to their coping ability. Um, and it tends to shorten the counseling also because the homework you give them will stimulate the self empowerment. Now, homework is necessary, but shouldn't anyway be redundant and boring. In other words, it needs to be useful. It doesn't need to be redundant in, in other words, superfluous. Um, it, it needs to be valued. Uh, it needs to be of, of, of great value to the couple you're seeing. Now, I may refer to couple therapy tonight, but you can also employ these measurements and these tactics on single people. You know, you can also employ it on a, on, on any person you see in counseling, you know. Um, but there's seven main dimensional support and care factors, and this won't be in your test. Nothing I'll be speaking about tonight will be for your test. Don't worry, okay? But um, I'll just give you a set up about your assessment or your test a little bit later tonight. But but I just want to get our coursework behind us. And, and remember, this whole session, which I'm discussing with you right now, it won't be in your test. So don't make, uh, don't let your head break about this, okay? Um so, so we need to keep all seven dimensions of wholeness. Um, um, of wholeness. I'm sorry. Let me just see what's going on here on my screen. Oh yeah, um, we need to keep all seven dimensions dimensions of wholeness in the back of our conscience to remind us to focus on whichever ones seem to be clinically relevant to understanding and helping particular counselees. So, so you need to take care. You need to remember this, and you need to put it in the back of your mind. As when you speak to people, you know, you can tick it off and say, physically, they care for themselves. Mentally, they care for themselves. Work and play, yeah, they're good. Um, and eco-therapeutic concepts are good. Um, spiritual care and growth are good. But here at Social Justice, they're struggling a little bit. Or they're struggling at educated counseling to prepare for developmental transitions. Now, these are the seven-dimensional support systems. Now, <laughs> it's difficult stuff. You don't know that to remember this. But you can put it on a chart in your office as to when you counsel people, you can see if they are if they need some attention physically. If you have to get some some people in to help them to to gym a little bit more, like uh, Apostle Yaku is gymming every morning, 
or, or some other person that needs to give them a mental break, call in the pastor Sean to give them some mental assistance and work and play, call in pastor Dirk. So, um, so while focusing on the painful problems they mention in session, the needs they've got and the dysfunctions, um, you know, they bring along to counseling and to the counseling room. And obviously they will bring along some, um, some dysfunctions. Also look for their hidden strengths. In this session you have with the counselee, you'll have to look for hidden strength, assets, hopes. You need to look for life goals as you speak with them, you know, as you talk with them. And, and other later resources, affirm these valuable resources and encourage counselees to begin using them to cope. Encourage them to use these and, and, and obviously their homework to cope. Because I'm going to give you some instructions tonight what type of homework you can give to them, but you'll have to encourage them to use this creatively so that they can impact, you know, their, their own skills. And, and like, for example, they, they're doing self-maintenance on their relationship because people do not have to come to therapy every day when they have a fight. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not necessary. They can come to therapy or to the, to the pastor when they've got the problem, when they, when they cannot deal with this crisis on their own at that stage. When persons are stunned or paralyzed by their feelings of anxiety and their guilt and their tragic loss hey, life, obviously... Okay, I'll do that. Hey, uh -huh, no, wait. Right, Pastor um, Rufus, just mute yourself, please. Thank you, man. Okay, so what happens is, um, you know, after this crushing self-esteem and everything is just gone, obviously, it is often helpful to urge them to do whatever constructive activities they can do to help themselves. It's always better to teach people how to help themselves. This is the ultimate goal of counseling and being a mentor to some people is you functioning in a, in a way so that they can, you know, help themselves in the end. Well, you can give a fish for the hunger people. You can give them another fish. You can help them again with a fish. But in, in the end, you'll have to decide if you're going to just start giving out fishes or you're going to teach them how to fish themselves. Give them the tools how to fish. And now this is what homework is about. You putting yourself in a position of preparing yourself for a session and giving some homework to the attendees or to the counselee. And this is very important that you'll have to you know, put these things in your mind, the seven dimensions of, 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 of the person that needs support and care. This time diminishes the tendency to, to retreat into depression, obviously, when you give them homework. Because when they've got homework, they've got something to work with. Because when they come to you in a sense, in, in a state of desperateness, obviously they will feel there's no way left or right. They do not know which way to go. But but um, when you give them homework, it's they start to feel, you know, they've got something to live for. They cannot wait for the next assignment. Some couples come to my office and they cannot wait for the next assignment. But you'll never see me, you know, pursuing a, um, a family therapy or even marriage counseling um, if they do not correspond with their homework. When they come to me and they want to make another appointment, I will always ask them, is your homework complete? If not, I don't want to see you. I want you to complete your homework before you come back because the ultimate goal of counseling is, is so that they can, at the end, have self-control and obviously have the ability to, um, to, to, to maintain themselves, to maintain their own relationships. Such activities provide temporary structure also to the suffering people's um, chaotic life. Um, and I mean, it provides them with a new beginning. It provides them with opportunities to change painful events into something fun or better in their lives. But very important, chaplain, pastor, that you never should focus on the past. Focus on the past only if it haunts and limits constructive change and in the present or in this or is a source of information about earlier success in coping this is from our client in his book pastoral care and support now now this i want to read it again so that you can sink in focus on the past only if it haunts and limits constructive change in the present or is a source of information about earlier success in coping in other words we do not go to the past because we 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 refuse to take care of the past uh, unless the past can be used 
as a constructive way in the here and now. Remember what I told you always is that there is three days and which one of the three days is important. You've got yesterday, you've got today, and you've got tomorrow. Which day is the most important one? Can you remember that? Anybody? It's not that one, but it's this one. <laughs> The most important day of your, of your life is today. It's not the past. We shouldn't focus on the past. And unfortunately, many people, they waste a lot of their energy and, their, and they, they, they get emotionally drained, spiritually drained because of the, of the load they are carrying of the past into the future. They've got so much baggage, so much issues they have to take care of. And it's, it's really tiring. Many people, they will be so tired at night, and they will just come from work to their beds, and they will just sleep. The mother and mother will do the same thing because they cannot shake off the past. You need to shake off the past. And this is what the, the most important thing is for counseling is that we do not go to the past unless the past may, con may be constructive in counseling and taking counseling forward. If you need to speak about that, obviously, and if this information that comes from the past that can help the relationship if it can con if it can be constructive, obviously, then you can use that. But you also have to give the counselee some options. So you give them and say, "Listen now, you should not always, <laughs> you know, look at the past because if you always look in the rear mirror of your car, say for example, you're driving down the down the road and you're always watching the rear mirror, what will happen? You'll miss the opportunity right in front of you to break." To break now is a good time, you know. Put on the brake because sometimes you'll be in an accident because you're watching the rear mirror all the time. And that is what the past is all about. Some people will always look behind them, never focusing in front of them. And that's why you as a chap or pastor or as a counselor will help them and coach them to be people, you know, more focused on the here and now. You, you know, you coach your counselees also in reframing their problems or... or you know, rewriting their problems, the, the whole scenario, by developing more constructive perspectives on them. Because sometimes, you know, their, their perspective is very negative. How they perceive what they've got at that moment, you know, it, it's like draining them every time they think about what my wife is going to work. That was a place she, 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 she messed around with somebody else. And this is what your perception is. If that isn't constructive, you know, you have to reframe it. You have to rewrite the perspective and how you see things. Do this by guiding your counselee to see possibilities for more hopeful outcomes. There are more, there's more hopeful outcomes and useful learning stages. There are so many things you can teach them concerning being constructive in their perspectives. Because if you are always negative and perceive everything negative, there cannot be any growth. You will struggle to let, to, to let your counselee grow. After helping them explore their options also, coach them in choosing the, the most promising one. Because obviously, the, you, when you give them options, and, and there always needs to be options in a, in a counselling session. And I do not mean that you should get divorced or not. And that's not the option because when they come to you, they want to save their marriage. When they come to you, they want to be better. So, so in my first session, I always, always would ask the couple, do you love him? Yes, pastor. Do you love her? Yes, pastor. Do you want this marriage to work? Yes, pastor. So forget about the past. Let us look at some options right now. And I'll lead them through the options, how to, how to change you know, their perspectives, to be more constructive, and also remember to be more practical in your options, you know. You, you can collaborate with them in developing an action plan, if you will, to, to deal with the problem selected. If they've got a specific problem they want to discuss tonight or today in counseling, deal with them in an appropriate way, in a practical way, and then immediately take steps towards implementing that plan as soon as possible. When you discuss a plan with the counselee, never wait until the next session of our fruit two or three weeks, and then try to, because they will, it will be long forgotten. As soon as you can, you, you um, deploy that plan, the selected plan, obviously, because you have given some options. They have looking at the options, and they said, Pastor, this plan is the best one. I want to take it. This movement obviously will help them 
begin the recovery process a lot earlier and it will help them to process or mobilize, um, you know, their, their dying hearts, their latent problem-solving skills, and, and it will revive that problem-solving problem skills and also their coping resources. It will revive all of that very quickly if you can get them involved in a practical way in, in the options you offer. But also give them emotional support and inspiration during the course of time. You can do that by way of a WhatsApp. You can do that by way of a call just to check on them and to see, are you doing okay? You know, just what's up to say, how are you? Uh, you know, it will mean the world for these people. And this is also kind of a follow-up. It's not to per se that when you reach out to them, you want to draw them back into a counseling room, but it's only just to find out if you can provide them some emotional support or inspiration of some kind, because some inspiration at the right time will go a far, far way. It will help a lot. And then it comes to a very, very important part of the counseling, and that is confrontation. Some people just love confrontation. Now, confrontation, every kind of confrontation should be very gentle. It should be very gentle in early stages of counseling. Because if you are, if there's confrontation, let, let's say in the couple, between the husband and the wife, and the confrontation is hectic, then obviously it will make the rest of the counseling very difficult for that night. So yes, for the first time you see them or the second time you see them, let confrontation be there, but let, but let it be very gentle. And you should give them a disclaimer when they start to confront one another with bad things. Listen, people, let's be gentle tonight. This is our first session together. Let's be gentle. Wayne Oates said the door of relationship should always be left ajar so persons can feel free to come back again if they choose to do so. But if that room, if there is a lot of confrontation in that room and they leave that room even angry, more angry than they've come there, obviously there won't be a, an open door for them to enter into because they, will, they would want to get away from you. After counselees become aware of the council acceptance and caring concern firm and also caring confrontation, is more likely to be accepted because there are a caring confrontation, a gentle one. Keep aware throughout counseling of relevant spiritual values, value issues, or whatever the case may be, and do what is needed, uh, Pastor. Do what is needed to help the counselee to grow because growth is pivotal in, in, in the time they come to see you. Even if they're there just for 45 minutes, because remember that last week we spoke about how long a counseling session should be, and we said, between 45, maximum 50 minutes. Normally, the first session will be a little bit more lengthy, maybe an hour or so, but never, you know, overdo anything. I mean, do not sit with people for over two hours. It will tire you, but it also will tire them so that they won't want to come back afterwards. Um, but, and remember now, the reason why we always, you know, tell the people when they come, they say, we've got about 45 minutes, let's get through this. And let's see what we can do to help you guys. Um, and when the time comes, you'll tell them, listen, we've got 15 minutes left. Remember now, they are, they are cognitively, they are distorted because they only can see their own problem. They do not see time at that stage because they're busy with a confrontation. They're busy fighting the good fight in your office. So, so for them, time is no issue. But for you, time is an issue because you've got a family and you, you have to spend some time in prayer before the next couple come in. Before closing counseling relationships, make sure you have an accepting relationship that will make it easy for people to come back, as Wayne Oates says. Be before you close it, you have to make sure that people will come back again and, and return in a, in a free way, not in a confrontational way. Now we've got the ABCDE, an operational model for short-term counseling. You can use this model if you will, but you don't have to. You'll find the best model during the course of time that you can use uh, to do effective counseling. But if you want to use this model, you're most welcome to do that. You can also find this model in Dr. Harold Campbell's book, um, Pastoral Care and Counseling, the one I've sent you some time back. Now, the first step in the ABCDE, and I will discuss the ABCDE right now, because this will take us about 20 minutes, just this discussion of the ABCDE. Um, and you must understand, Pastor, it's an operational model 
for short-term counseling. What is short-term counseling? It's not long-term counseling. Short-term counseling, you're speaking about three to six sessions. But when you speak about long-term counseling, you talk about a longer periods of time, like a few months, you know. Now, the first step is the A, and it says achieve a therapeutic relationship of trust and caring by using empathetic dialogue, listening, and responding. This is the very first thing you have to do. It aims, this aims, this whole model aims, this whole model aims at practical solutions to immediate problems, problems that's occurring right now at this moment, and thus is similar to some of the insights of solution-oriented therapies. Many counselees can learn to use all five steps in a few sessions to cope with their problems more constructively. You can teach these, this model for your counselees. I have used this model profitably as a tool for introducing pastors, seminarians, and trainees for like caring teams to the basic process of helping people efficiently as well as expeditiously. Because people do not want to come to your office and do not go home with an answer. Now, the second point of this model is the B. The step two is boil down the problems. Let me just run over these because we're going to discuss this in, 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 in a little bit. Step three, C, challenge care receivers to focus on taking constructive action as quickly as possible. You can take a snapshot if you like with this. And also step four, point D, develop concrete growth action plans collaboratively. And step five, point E, empower effective coping by implementing the action plans in, uh, incrementally. Well, that's, that means you'll see in a bit, we, we take bits by bits in implementing. Now, if you can see the A, achieve. The B, boil. The C, challenge. The D, develop. The E, empower. This is good stuff. Now, if you do not have a model at this stage for doing counseling, this is a great model to use. You can use it for free. <laughs> you don't have to pay for this. Now, the first one is A, and that is achieve a therapeutic relationship of trust and caring by using empathetic, dialogical uh, listening as well as responding. If you, all, if you already are acquainted with persons seeking help at this stage, as pastors often are, we are, I mean, who of you do not know about anybody that do not have a problem? You can always invite them in to do some practical on them. Or you, your task is in this to identify and deepen the relationship for purposes of counseling. You want to get closer to this couple. You want to learn and teach them about the ways they need to go, how to resolve their problems effectively. So here are the basics, the basic methods for implementing this step. Let people know how much time you have to talk. How much time do you need in every session? Thus expressing respect for your limits and boundaries. Because if you have a time limit on them, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, at least 45, you, you cannot go over 45 or even 50 minutes, you, 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 you ask them to respect your time and also you respect theirs. And also listen carefully. Listen carefully to what they say. If you can listen carefully to what they say, then obviously um, it will tell them a lot about your conduct as a chaplain or a pastor or as a counselor. Um, but listen carefully. And that means that what the individual or the couple or the family tells you in their communicating, they're communicating verbally or, or um, non-verbally to you. So, so if you listen, you not only listen with your ears, but you also listen with your eyes. <laughs> you get me? You get me? Because when we listen carefully, you watch and you hear. Now, then also periodically respond to sometimes, you know, very briefly by paraphrasing what you understand them, you know, to be saying and feeling at that stage. You know, paraphrasing means that, oh, so Yaku, you say that you're a little bit angry with the other. Okay. Do I understand you correctly? that you're angry because you swapped your credit card for a dress, then obviously that means that you have been listening to Yakub when he was packing down about his wife in, in your ears. So also see them as precious, these people that comes to you. See them as precious people, unique individuals, who like all of us are human beings. We all have unique problems and weaknesses, but we also have special strengths. 
as well as potentials. And your job, uh, counselor, is to draw out that strengths and that potentials and to highlight it for them. Because they don't see it at that moment because they're angry. They don't see it because they do not have options from to choose. They only have this problem. Be aware that they can learn to develop their potentials also so as to handle their problems more constructively and grow in their general well-being because this is at the most important that we want them to grow in this process. So as it seems appropriate, let them catch your hope also because, you know, hope is contagious. Hope is contagious. When you've got a lot of hope for people, they'll catch on to that. They'll immediately see, but this man, this counselor, he's got hope in us. He's hoping that our relationship will work out. I mean, when you see people, it's not only for the money or, I mean, I've never charged people in my life for counseling, but, but I've, I've reconsidered this at this stage because I need to do that because otherwise, you know, the ministry cannot go on. So, so my, my, my decision was that I'll have to charge them now from now on. Then obviously, uh, but when they come to you, hope will be contagious. Hope will be contagious because you are sharing your hope that Christ brought into your life. And, and, and also it comes, it comes from a positive um, you know, perspective, if you will. Then also we have to form dialogue. During this dialogue, this discussion, ask for any important information that seems to be missing from what they are saying to you right now. Uh, ask them, is there anything I'm missing? I, I, I listened to you. I watched you. But is there anything missing from what you are saying to me tonight? For example, their feelings about needing to ask for help and what they expect of, 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 or want from you as a counselor or when problems started in, the, in their relationship or how they developed or the probable cause in the relationship and the struggle they are facing and what the individuals have done so far. Have they seen anybody? Did you see anybody during this time? Or am I the first counselor you've seen? Then also, you have to keep the main focus on current problems. Listen, listen, Pastor, current problems. We focus on current problems. We do not focus on past problems. We don't like to go there. Yes, we don't like to go there because the past is the past. You can do nothing about the past. You have to die, you know, in your mindset, obviously in your mindset, about the past, gently but firmly resist excursions they make into the past problems. Like she said to me three years back, or she did this four years back. They seem directly relevant to dealing with their current situation, but they're not. Affirm, affirm them, obviously, whenever you can to do so genuinely, and it feels appropriate to allow discussions of the past, then obviously you need to feel also comfortable with that, counselor. You might say something like, I want you to know that I'm aware that it takes real strength and courage to face painful problems like yours, honestly, and ask for professional help if you need to. Just tell them they need to ask for professional help if they want to, to, to pursue the past. We, we're not in this business in pursuing the past. We run for today and tomorrow. If you decide that short-term counseling is likely to be helpful, say to, to the counselees something like, in light of what you have shared with me, I think that you might find it helpful for us to work together a few times or a few weeks, a couple of weeks. The purpose would be to develop practical ways for you to handle your problems more effectively. Now, this is the thing you'll tell the counselee. I can help you, you know, in the, in, in the, in the short-term counseling. The purpose would be to develop practical ways. I want you to develop pra practical ways for your relationship and how to handle your problems more effectively how to address these issues you've just mentioned. Um, and remember the form I showed you the other day. Um, I, will, I will share it with you in a, in a few minutes. Also identify relevant symptoms you are currently dealing with. That's, that's good homework. They can fill it out when they come to you. And, and then obviously we'll have time to make some study about the problems they are facing so that you can address, address these social, so, uh, psychosocial problems. If they decide to accept your offer as a counselor, ask the next question, what would you like the outcome of counseling to be for you? This is so important, Pastor. They need to tell you, listen, listen, Pastor, I want to be married. I want to be happily married with my wife or my husband, for that sake. Or ask something like, 
what would you like to learn from dealing with the problem you are facing right now? I, what do you want me to teach you to, to deal with this problem of you effectively? Because I'll help you with that. Well, it doesn't help you to give them some things they don't want, they don't need. Give them things they need to survive in their relationship. Then step two in the ABCDE is boil down the problems. This step means working with counselees collaboratively to, dis- to divide confusing and complex issues into more understandable and meaning uh, uh, manageable um, segments of the, of the work. Because manageable part is easier. The second step usually begins during the first step as the healing relationship is being strengthened. If counselees describe several current problems, coach them to prioritize their problems. Coach them to prioritize them in an effective way to, in, in terms of urgency and importance. Do not eat the whole elephant at, at, at the first session. <laughs> Break the elephant down. How do you eat the elephant, by the way? You eat an elephant piece by piece. You cannot swallow it. It's impossible. But you need to, you need to address the elephant in the room when they're there. But coach them to prioritize the problem if the problem is, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a multi-functional uh, or a, a multi-problem. And for example, it's it's my in-laws and it's finances, it's my job. Ask them to prioritize and tell you what is the most important thing you want. They want to speak about. You can speak about everything at once, so that they can identify the urgency as well as the importance, and then to choose which one they will work with for the first session. Because the first session is is a whole week or so until the second session. Which one they want to deal with first? Sorting out and prioritizing the parts of, of a given problem reduces the counselee's sense of helplessness also, as well as prepares them to use their coping abilities in a focused and more effective way. This is what we want for them to self-maintain, to self, you know, resolve their problems, not always to run to the pastor or to the counselor, but, you know, to, to be able to prioritize their own issues, to deal with them in a, in a, in a, in a constructive way or in a manageable, um, part, partable way. Um, but also prioritizing them may also help you to, to counsel these people in a better way. Use questions carefully. Use questions carefully when you speak to them. Um, uh, you know, use questions carefully to focus on conflict areas rapidly like this. It's like a fast response after giving persons an initial opportunity to describe the problems. Asking a few key questions can fill in the major gaps in the essential information by exploring neglected dimensions of problems and looking for solutions. Because many times people will come to you, they'll give you all, all, you know, the the, the whole bag of potatoes. But here and there, there will be some things they've missed out on because you need to connect all of these dots because it's like a, it's like a part of spaghetti. Everything is touching each other because they, they're in crisis mode now. They want to resolve this problem ASAP. Now, Howard Clambell gave an example, and he says, Mrs. D, a woman in her mid-40s, consulted her pastor for help in the, deciding whether to leave her alcoholic husband. So through disciplined listening, now this is what he did, disciplined listening, the pastor began to grasp the broad outlines of the situation. Many years of the husband's excessive drinking, a series of job losses occurred and repeated broken promises to stop drinking also excessively. He just went on. He never stopped to drink. But he always promised his wife that he'll stop. So to be of help as a pastoral guide, the pastor had to know whether the man had any awareness of his need for help. The nature of the marital marital interaction, as well as the dynamic role of other family members during this course of time. So he didn't just say straight away, just divorce him. He asked a couple of questions to make sense about all of this. And and, And the reason why he did that is because of disciplined listening. The most efficient way to acquire this knowledge was to ask the woman and eventually to ask her husband about that. As you coach counselees, Pastor, in sorting out the parts of their problems, remember now, a problem is huge until you disassemble it in different parts. It's like servicing a motor car engine. 
You cannot service the motor car engine while the motor is still running. You have to stop the motor car, disassemble all of those different parts, look at the parts to see if it's still functional, and fix it if it needs to be fixed. You cannot fix all of it at once. You need to disassemble it and part by part fix the problem. And this is how counseling also works. Encourage them to distinguish the parts that they may be able to do something about from those about which little or nothing can be done. Start with the smaller parts that's more manageable. It may be well to remind them of what is obvious, but that they may be overlooking in their uh, burdened minds by saying something like, I think you'll agree that there's no use wasting your coping energies or strength on the latter. But we need to help persons review their total problem. We we'll have to help them to review this. Now, this enables them to gain a clearer perspective and helps prepare them to make wise decisions also. It also helps them to mobilize their inner and outer resources because all of us, we've got inner as well as outer resources. Now, Mrs. D, we referred to Mrs. D earlier, had become so obsessed with her husband's drinking that she had neglected her friendships in the church, which she needed so desperately. She just focused on this negative thing. And remember what we said in our earlier slide, you know, she had a, um, where were we now? Let me just go back there. Um, all right. She's got a, she had an, a negative perception about everything. She had a negative perception about everything. And because she was always focusing on her husband's drinking, she forgot about the relationships at church. And this is the problem. She becomes so obsessed that she lost a lot of friendships, a lot of encouragement. So as a result of her pastor's guidance, she began to rebuild the support system at church again. So provide useful information to these people. They need it. They need it so, so desperately. By explaining certain well-established facts about the nature and treatment of alcoholism, there's a possibility that you can be treated. The pastor helped this with this. And also, in this case, the pastor helped Mrs. D., um, uh, you know, not to abandon her fruitful attempts, uh, but to abandon her futile attempts to shame her husband into controlled drinking because she was always moaning and griping and she was always angry when she came home. And he, he asked her just to control that emotions. So such educative elements in brief counseling can provide persons with so much information and ideas so that they can improve their own situation just to better their own lives in that stage. Now, the third one, that is step three, is the C. Now, this is a counseling model. This is one counseling model. There are a number of counseling models. We're not going to discuss all of that because we only have to not left with um, helping people in crisis. But the third step is challenge care receivers to focus on taking constructive action as quickly as possible. Now, who is, who is care receivers? These are the counselees. We need to encourage them to focus to, you know, to for constructive action and take it quickly. Help the person decide on the first step as well as the, the ones they have to take it and that they have to take it immediately. Getting persons to act constructively even if decisions, if decisions you know, and actions are on minor matters helps people or helps break them or, or the paralysis of the chronic indecisions. In Mrs. D's case, the past then helped her plan the steps she would take the next day to discover job possibilities for her husband, as well as sources of temporary financial support. That discussion helped her also to, to see that she needed something, and during counseling, she realized she's got it. Just before she could make any larger decision, she, she made that summarization that she can do it. So help them understand that talking or taking small steps will tend to enhance their problem-solving abilities. Never take, take giant steps when you've got a problem you're facing. If you take giant steps, you make messes of that. I mean, it's like you're tired. You're really tired about everything that's going on in your relationship or in your workplace. And now you take that giant steps. And sometimes you make judgment mistakes in that process. Now, if you take small steps, it will also, uh, you know, it will lift their spirits by increasing their hope and energy for a healing and coping bit by bit, small pieces by small pieces. This is essentially true for care seekers who have been like 
the sick man in John's gospel who had been lying beside the pool called Beth Bethesda for 38 years. His healing, his healing began when he finally took action in response to Jesus' confrontation. Otherwise, he would have still laid there today. <laughs> but also help them focus on the positive takeaways in the session. There is always positive takeaways. In any crisis, there are some things you can learn. This will sharpen their awareness of resources they have or can develop to use in coping with their problems. Now, this pastor will help them if they can take this away. Positive things they can take away from the session. Positive things they can take away from communicating with their spouse. And obviously, it can help them in the future. Include it, maybe their inner strength and vision also. Friends can be included. Um, and another takeaway is family or um, spiritual resources at church or, or even spiritual resources on your phone. And anything can help, support and help from the congregation and the community and the coaching available from you as a counselor. And that all is positive takeaways for them. So help them to focus on these because that will ultimately help them. Now the fourth step is the D, and that's develop concrete growth action plans collaboratively. In other words, with their, you know, help, coach care seekers in developing practical plans to take action on the part of or parts of the problem they have chosen. Remember, they've disassembled the whole problem now. This, the, the problem is laying in front of them on the table and in a whole lot of parts. Now, they've chosen to take this part and this part to deal with it in the first week and that part and that part in the second week. They will be more motivated to do the hard work involved in planning if they feel they are about to move ahead to what changes they strongly desire to make. In other words, help them to, to do the easy things first so that they can get into the in good practice. The plan should focus initially on parts of their problems, not of, of yours, obviously, as a counselor. They may have decided they can solve at least this one problem. And obviously, the solving skills will improve during the course of times. The plan should be achievable as well as grounded in the strength and limitations of their unique situation. Because remember now, at every crisis, there is opportunity. In every crisis, there is unique, a unique situation that they can learn something out, out of. In the planning collaboration, they should be encouraged to think of a new <coughs> or previously successful solution. And then obviously avoid the felt ones. It doesn't help them to try to, 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 to ride a dead horse. Avoid the felt ones. They've already tried. Do not try it again if they have tried it before. After they have described action options they think of, feel free to suggest um, other solutions for them to consider also. If you hear what they want and what they need, then obviously the Holy Spirit will lead you to make some other suggestions also. Help them to evaluate each option being considered in terms of probable long-range consequences as well as effectiveness. Something like, if you take this action, what are the odds that this will work? If you take this, if you do this now, what will the odds that it will work? Where, where is it likely to aid or to lead you? Or something like, is this outcome one of that you see as a constructive and desirable for yourself uh, or the others in your family or yourself or maybe your society. Encourage them to build, to build a definite re realistic timeline for themselves, how to get through this problem. I mean, it's their plan, it's, it's their job. You're just the guidance counselor. So the timeline should include when they will begin implementing the chosen parts of their plans. Remember the parts on the table? You know, I will do this in the first week, the second week, the third week. And also the steps in the process. The timeline should show, show that. But this is their timeline, not yours. And when they aim at completing action, it also needs to say, we need to complete this action by the end of January. We want to finish up with counseling and we want to have all of this, you know, in place. Make sure they build accountability into their action plan. They need to be held accountable if they come to you, you know, and say to you, listen, Pastor, chaplain, pastor, uh, counselor, this is our action plan. We thank you for the time, but would you help us, you know, restore our relationship and, and, and giving us guidance, you know, until we reach our um, um, action plan or the goal in our action plan. If they come to you in the next week, 
They haven't done their homework part. They need to be held accountable for that. You know, they need to help be held accountable for that. How do you plan to measure success in making progress towards this goal you have chosen? You can ask them this kind of questions. To whom will you report regularly on your progress to help yourself keep to move in and implement the plan further on? You can help the counselee with that. Examine and test the accuracy of their perceptions and how they perceive this plan, as well as the wisdom of, 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 of remedial actions they, they plan during the course of time. You um, urge them also to spell out meaningful rewards they will give themselves when they take planned action or make progress towards a goal or rewards they will withhold if they don't um, uh, you know, do what they said they're going to do or plan uh, or don't do what they planned they're going to do. Like, for example, when they tell you, listen, Pastor, we're going to come um, next week again. We will be doing this. And then obviously they won't receive a reward that week. By giving or withholding rewards, they will reinforce momentum as they move towards coping more effectively with the loose parts of the problem. Not as a whole, but as the loose parts of the problem. The fifth and the last step in this ABCDE model is empower effective coping by implementing the action plans incrementally. <clears throat> Counselor, you should encourage counselors to begin by taking planned actions on um, which their changes of succeeding are higher. To, um, I mean, the chances are, are, you know, that it can be, they will, they will be successful in that plan or in this crisis, the chances are higher. So that when they get a positive feedback on that, they will obviously be ignited and positive uh, for the next step. Initial success will increase hope. When they see a little problem sorted out, that will increase hope in their hearts. It will also give them energy and momentum for keep going on. If they resist acting on planned parts of their problem, help them explore and resolve these resistance in their hearts. Share this useful image. By take, say for example, by taking constructive action, your coping skills will respond like muscles in your body. They will grow stronger as they exercise. They'll grow stronger every day when you exercise, just as, the, as they would lose strength if they, if they just stay dormant, like mine. <laughs> I've losing strength somewhat. My muscles have been dormant for a couple of months now. They'll grow stronger as they are exercised, just as they would lose strength if they stay dormant. To honor this principle, this is what you say to your counselee, to honor this principle as well as to protect yourself from caregiver fatigue or caregiver overload for yourself now, follow this guideline. Do not, listen up, do not do for counselees what they could do for themselves. Do not do for counselees what they can do for themselves. Let them do it for themselves. And thus become healthier and more empowered themselves and you less tired, um, Pastor. Assure them that the more they struggle to cope constructively, the easier it probably will become because their coping muscles will grow stronger and more effective as they exercise them. Their hope also will probably get the uh, the needed boost as they take small but important steps to implement their change um, plans and, and as well as they will know that they are moving ahead towards hurting less and enjoying life a little more. This is what the ultimate goal is, hurting less and enjoying life more. But caution, caution them not to ob obsess in self-blame when they don't you know, take these steps and, and they're not successful with every single step they're taking. Say something like, if you, bl if, if you blow it by not doing something you had, to, you had planned on your, on your chart, you know, it's smart not to beat up yourself with guilt. It's much better to reinvest your mental energy quickly, in a way, in an alternative action that seems more actively or attractively, as well as it, it, it can help you to push yourself over the limits. Recommend a similar approach to them when their actions fail to produce the results for which they have hoped for so that they won't walk out there negative and say, but we, we hope for this target, didn't reach it in our timeline. Now you can give them something else to think about, something else to work on that next week. It can be productive to analyze such failures briefly, to learn how not to repeat these 
ineffective action plans. But rather than spend much valuable time and energy in that direction also, it's better to begin implementing another option chosen from their backup um, strategies. Because every every counselor, uh, every counselee, they've got backup strategies. We can work on that. Now, as they implement their plans, ask them to phone you once or twice, you know, or have a face-to-face -face contact with you so they can explain how, they, how they've been and how they've been working with this plan. This is particularly helpful request for counselees who seem to be wavering in their courage and intention to take difficult steps towards um, responsible change so that when, you, when they speak to you, you can encourage them how to think positive about what just will be happening soon. All right. Um, now we're going to speak about marriage homework assignments. Um, this will also take about 30 minutes. Let's take a five-minute break. Let's take a five-minute break. Um, just just to go for a leg stretch. We'll be back five minutes past eight on the clock, if you don't mind. All right, so welcome back after a um, short break. Um, we, are busy. we are busy with BC308, helping people in crisis. The second part of that training. Um, so yeah, we're going to discuss a little bit about marriage homework assignments. Um, very important that, that you'll always send people home with homework. Homework helps them to, to create, you know, you know, the needed exercises, the needed muscle strength. Um, it's like going to the gym. You need some exercises. You need some, you know, strengthening exercises. No matter what this activity is, the only thing that matters is that the activity is something you can do together as a couple. I'm not talking about you as a counselor. You're not part of that exercises okay um this is from positive psychology.com you can find it there and also is something you can do regularly in other words maybe daily if you want even more more than once a day and also it needs to be something enjoyable or at least not unpleasant for both partners and it's something that allows you to communicate in a healthy as well as a productive way for example if something is enjoyable for a, com a couple, like um, they, they, they do dancing. I mean, many years back, dancing was against the rules of the church. And still today, some churches, they've got this rule. You can dance, but, but, but you cannot enjoy it. Something like that. I'm not dancing, so I'm, I'm, just talking, uh, I'm just thinking out loud. But it needs to be something that allows you to communicate in a healthy and productive way. This is the ultimate goal. That and why we do these exercises, why we do these things, is that this exercise or this homework will help us to communicate in a better way, in a more functional way. Because many people they live in the dysfunctional homes and they, they they do not know how to communicate. They they struggle to communicate. Now the next slide, and this will keep us busy for some time, is that this is some relationship exercises you can do. Um, I think there are seven, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes. Your seven exercises. You do not have to employ all of it at once. <laughs> but the first one is like soul gazing. And this is an interesting one. Um, this is an intense exercise that will help you, as well as your partner, connect on a deeper level. So when you send them home, ask them to do some soul gazing on a daily basis for the next week or so. It can have a huge impact on, on your sense of connectedness with your spouse. But it's not for the faint-hearted to, to do soul gazing. To try this exercise, you have to. This, I'm explaining it to you so that you can explain it to the counselee. All right, so you can do this exercise with your with your uh, uh, wifey at at home, so that you can easily bring it to the office to in, in your counseling session. Um, it can have a huge impact. This exercise um, on your sense of connectedness with your spouse, but also um, it can help you to to strengthen your heart. To try this exercise, you'll have to have to be seated, you know, across your partner. Move so close as you can on your chair to theirs um, and then and, and let your knees, you know, nearly touch her. And look each other into the eyes and obviously hold eye contact for three or five minutes while just sitting there like that, just monitoring her in her eyes. And, uh, don't worry, 
it's not a competition to see who's going to laugh first. But but just try that for three to five minutes just to to do some soul gazing. Not saying a word. Not talking. Nothing. Refrain from talking at all for the following three to five minutes. This is one exercise. It's exercising this muscle of communication. Simply look into one another's eyes. Even if it's awkward at first, later it will get easier. If the silence is uncomfortable and you don't like the silence too much, because I know some people, they cannot watch other people, look other people in the eyes. Their eyes will jump the whole time. But just try that. I mean, this is a good exercise. But if you don't like the silence and you're feeling uncomfortable about that, just play your favorite song. Um, um, you know, this was written by Gray in 2014. And then extended cuddle time. You should extend cuddle time also. It can help a lot. This exercise is just as simple as the previous one. And as well as it's a lot of fun to cuddle a little bit. I mean, as it sounds, cuddle. It's good to cuddle. <laughs> then it can help any relationship. It's easy to get distracted with a cell phone. It's easy to get distracted by a tablet that's beeping or a book or a bedtime story you want to read. Um, but cuddling is actually a much better way to end your day than anything else. And the reason why people grow apart is because their cell phone gets in between, you know, of them and their gaming and stuff like that. I've seen so many couples, many ladies would come. I say, Pastor, please speak to my husband about this gaming. Uh, we never cuddle anymore. They need that. Everybody needs that. And there's no better way to cuddle before the day ends. The chemicals that are being released when we cuddle with our partner improve our mood also, deepening our connection as well as help us to sleep better that night. I always tell my wife, please put your tablet down. I want to cuddle. <laughs> this exercise is intended to be practiced right before bedtime. But you can, you can carve out any time during the day to cuddle a little bit. I mean, there's no rules in that. I mean, some people work night shift. They need to come home and cuddle a little bit. The important thing is to get someone, you know, or someone on one time, you know, show practical affection to them and enhance your intimacy with your partner. The third one, the seven breath forehead connection exercise. Now, you do not have to remember these things. I mean, this is just good tools I'm giving you tonight. This won't be in your test. But this seven breathing exercise against the forehead, this exercise is an excellent way to take your mind off what is happening around you and to put your focus directly on your partner. To begin this, you either, either have to lie down on your side like this by your partner or sit up straight, you know, in front of your partner, face each other and gently put your foreheads together like this, like this, you know, like this, putting your foreheads together like that. Make sure your chins are Tilt down so you know you won't be bumping in your noses and so on in your chins, you know, to, to refrain from kissing at this point. But breathe at least seven slow, deep breaths in sync with your partner. Now, this might be difficult at first to do that because many people won't get to the seventh breath until they start to kiss. <laughs> but it might be difficult, but but you need to train yourself in doing this be, before you know and before long. It will be a custom, you know, and sometimes you'll have even, you know, prolonged breaths, you know, like 20 or 30 breaths, simply breathing in and out together, in and out together. Now, these, there are, there's no disadvantages to feel connected with your partner. So go for it. I mean, if you feel more connected with the soul gazing or the extended cuddle time or the seven breaths for a touch, now, this close breathing exercise will put you and your partner into an intimate, connected space at that time. At that moment, you'll feel connected with her or him. Practice it whenever you feel the need to slow down and refocus on each other. You can typically, I would take a picture right now, a pastor, and you can try it at home. Um, <laughs> try it on your wife and before you give it to other people to do. Then also on uninterpreted, uh, sorry about that, uninterrupted listening. Another simple but powerful exercise is called uninterrupted listening, and it's exactly what it, it, it sounds like, uninterrupted listening. 
We all need to feel hurt and understood. We feel we want to be cared for. And this exercise can help us both. And obviously, I'm talking about the council lead, both of them now, um, in, in, in a better way. Set a timer for those exercises. Set a timer for this exercise. You know, three to five minutes will usually do the trick. And let your partner just talk to you. They can talk about whatever is on their minds. It can be about work. It can be about school, your kids. Uh, it can be about you, the friends, the family and stress and etc. It can be all about fair game. While they are speaking, your job is to do one thing and one thing only, just to listen. Now, you're not involved with this right now, counselor. You're just giving the advice. You're just telling them this is how the exercise works. You are going to try it this week also because I want to hear your feedback how it went. <laughs> So you just go out and, and do this exercise with your wife this week. Now, while they are speaking, your job is to do one thing, and that's to listen. Do not speak at all until the timer goes off. Simply listen to your partner and soak it in awe. While you may not speak during this time, you are free to give your partner nonverbal encouragement. Ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. Not just sit like this. Just give some nonverbal encouragement. Um, encouragement so that she'll just go on and give some body language. Mm, ah, you know, something like that. Facial expression, look happy or meaningful looks, whatever you need to do. Now, when the timer goes off, switch roles. You don't have to switch seats, just switch roles. And the exercise begins again. You may find that one partner is much chattier than the other, normally the ladies, which is totally um, normal, of course. Some years back, I had a counseling session, and uh, Brother Pete is now with Jesus. Brother Dirk Fisher knows them very well. The Leon and Pete was married for many, many years. But they came to me when I was just called to Ilovsdal Full Gospel Church, and, and I had a counseling session with them. I will never forget that. And I, and I always use this in as, as, as an apology or an analogy, uh, well, as an example. Let's, let's use that better word then. Um, they will always interrupt one another in session when I was speaking with them and, you know, counseling them in, in marital things. But what happened then is, um, at the end, I just told them, listen, you do not give each other time to speak. Now, let's do this. Pete, it's your turn now. Five minutes, then the lean. And until these days, <laughs> they, they did this uninterrupted listening um, um, exercise every day of their lives. So, so it really worked for them. They were still married. Um, until his death. So the miracle question, this exercise is, is, is great. It's a great way for couples to explore the type of future they would like to build um, individually. And as a couple, of course, we all struggle at times, but sometimes the struggle is greater because we simply do not know what our goals actually are. Sometimes we struggle with our own goals. Asking the miracle question can help you, your clients, it can help us um, in marriages to clarify your goals. This question, will have both partners to probe their own dreams and desires and learn about their partner's dreams and desires also. It can aid a couple in understanding what both they, um, what both they and their significant other needs in order to be happy during their lives. Now this you can find, this is what therapist Brian Hose phrases the medical question this way. He says, suppose tonight while you slept, a miracle occurred. When you wake tomorrow, what would be some of the things you would notice that would tell you life had suddenly gotten better? So this is the question, the miracle question. You go to bed tonight, my love, and tomorrow you wake up. What? And, and, and all of a sudden, things got better. What things did get better? This is the miracle question. But this is also one of the exercises. While other partner may give an answer, that is in, in, an impossibility in their uh, waking life, that answer can still be useful in this regard. Maybe some, the lady would say, um, when I wake up in the morning, you brought me coffee, you know, something like that. Or when I wake up in the morning, um, you know, um, you were shaved, <laughs> something like that. Or we were millionaires. So some of the things may really be impossible, but it's good things to work with, to see what they needed in their relationship, to, be, to have that dream relationship, to have that dream um, um, connection with the spouse. If practiced within the context of couple therapy, 
the therapist can dive deeper into the client's unrealistic miracle with this question. Now, how would that make a difference in your marriage? So if they tell you, listen, I wish we, uh, tomorrow I'm waking up and there's just money in my account, but how would that make a difference in your relationship? Now, this discussion with the clients, uh, you know, to envision a positive future in which their problems are addressed or mitigated and the therapist to learn how he or she can best serve the clients in their session. If you are engaging in this exercise without guidance of a therapist, don't try to dive too deep into this answer if, if it's unclear or unrealistic or impossible even. Instead, use this discussion as an opportunity to learn something new about your partner and plan for your future together. So if they ask, if you use this medical question at home and, and, and it, it becomes too difficult of a problem, get um, somebody to help you with this and to ask the relevant questions. The sixth one is the weekly CEO, CEO meeting. If you and your partner are leading lives jam-packed with activities, events, and obligations to the school, to the work, this exercise uh, will be great. Uh, it will be a great way to connect. This exercise provides you and your partner with an opportunity to interact as adults with no kids allowed and without distractions, no phones, no tablets, nothing, no computers. Schedule a non-negotiable chunk of time, uh, more or less 30 minutes at least, once a week for you and your partner to talk about how you both are feeling or how you are doing, your relationship as a couple, of course, and unfinished arguments or grievances you had with one another some time back, or any needs that are not being met at that stage. You just need 30 minutes a week just to put everything away just focus on this. Now is the time of the CEO. You can start the exercise with questions like, how do you feel about us today? Is there anything you're feeling complete about from this past week that you would like to talk about today? How can I make you feel more loved in the coming days? Is that possible? So, counselor, the answers to these questions should, should lead you and your partner in a healthy and productive discussion about yourselves and your relationship. Make sure to do this regularly to keep on top of any issue and ensure that things don't get swept under the rug or put back on the burner for far, for, uh, for far too long. The last one over here is the, the, the five things go exercise. Hey, another quick one, and, and that is an exercise you can also try at home. This exercise can be engaged in anywhere the two of you are together, anywhere. You only need your words and your imagination for this exercise. Come up with a theme for each time you practice this exercise. In other words, if you come to a, a place where you are together and you can exercise this thing, you have to have a theme for that event. Something like, what I'm grateful for, that's the theme. What I appreciate in you or what I'd like to do with you this month. Not today, this month. And list five things each within this theme. For example, if you're saying you're grateful, list five things you're grateful for in that, in that, um, in, in that scenario. You, should, you, you could have one partner go first and list all five things, or you have your partner could alternatively say, one for you, one for me. One time for you, one for me. However you decide to do it, be creative in that. And always, never be afraid to get silly with your partner at that stage because you know each other. As an example, you could ask your partner, what are five things that you love that I have done for you lately? Can you think about the five things that I've done for you? Um, some ladies would say, sorry, my love, I can't remember about one thing. But, oh, yeah, maybe just that one. The answers might be something like, taking out the trash, making a dinner reservation, getting my car detailed, cuddling me, watching me, uh, watching my favorite movies with you. Once they finish their list, come up with your, your own answer to the question, such as fixing the water heater, pulling weeds, sewing the button back on my shirt, telling me how much you love me and kissing me goodnight on my forehead or on my mouth. When you both finish sharing your list, you can talk about your items on the list, and then each one obviously 
um, appreciate one another or come up with more items together that you can accomplish together. Now, this exercise is fun and engaging um, way to connect with your partner, learn something new of your partner or reminiscence um, of a good shared memories. You can just sit down and think about good thoughts um, which you shared in the past. Okay, so uh, we're almost at the close, but before we do, um, uh, there was something I want to tell you now. Mm, I forgot about that. Let's go to the IRM. I, will, I probably will remember them better. Now, the IRM is one of my favorite models. I use it since 1990-something. <laughs> I've always been using the IRM. Now, IRM stands for um, the Interrelationship Method. Now, it's a relationship self-help tool. You can use it, and it's also for free. Now, the first step in the, um, the interpersonal relationship method is begin by identifying, affirming, and enjoying the strengths as assets in your relationship, the things you have going for you. In other words, I make it easy for myself when I tell the couple when I see them. Yes, obviously, the ABCDE works good, and the, the seven toolbox. This one also works excess, um, works fantastic. But this one also, especially when, when, when couples are, you know, for, they forgot where the strength lies and what pulled them together initially. For example, the first point is go home. Now, and this is not your exercise. This is the exercise you'll give your counselees. Go home with this exercise. I want to... I, want, I don't want to see you until you finish this exercise, please. But you'll need to have one week to exercise this. What I want you to do is write a list of at least five things you like your spouse doing for you. But you shouldn't sit together doing this. You, you should go to your room or, to, or, well, not to your room. So you'll go to the room because they're married now. I mean, And you'll go to the living room. Um, and then you'll write this list down of five items you love me doing for you. You like me doing for you. The thing you enjoy. She, she, she's been doing for you for the, for the past few years. So she'll come back with her list and you'll come back with your list. And then you exchange lists and you go back to your places again. You study this list and you keep it with you. And for the next week or so, you have to employ every single thing. You have to exercise every single thing she likes you do for her. You get that? So for at least one week. This is your first week of training. For if you if you are an, a new um, newly married couple, if you are a, if you are um, uh, you know engaged, it also helps for premarital counseling. It works well. And then the second step: identify the growing edge issues in your relationship. This is the negative things. So then obviously on the next week, you'll, you'll discuss the things that, that was positive, the positive things you have put into your partner's life. But the next exercise would be the negative things because there are negative things, the things you don't like your partner do. You do the same exercise. You go to, your, to the room and the other one goes to the living room. Make your list. Even if it's five to 10 items, no matter how many items there is, mo mostly women would write a book. Men would write, write um, a few lines. I've seen these lists in my office so many times. But anyhow, long story short is you exchange lists again. You go back to your separate places. You study the list. You come back and say, shut. This is an agreement. I won't do these things for the next week. So everything she wrote there, she doesn't like you to do. For example, she doesn't like you to come home late after work because you've been drinking with your buddies. Now, for the following week or so, you won't do that. Now, many times people would realize that, you know, we, we fall out of love with, the, with our loved ones because we do not fulfill, you know, that, that space. We do not fulfill that dream marriage or dream relationship um, because a, a woman dreams of a relationship and a male dreams of a relationship. And if they do not comply and, and if they do not fill that gaps, obviously, they will grow separate from one another. The third step, step three, in, in, intentionally increase the mutual satisfaction of your relationship and thus nurture your love by choosing a shared need that you both want to meet so then obviously you'll come to a place where you'll see well i need this you need this we're going to fulfill this need and then the fourth step and the last step implement your change plans so you you, you got your plans they've been writing these things down 
this is your plan. This is what you're going to do now for the rest of your life. You're going to, you're going to try your best to do the things for your wife that she enjoys. If she enjoys you lowering the mount with a, without a shirt, do it. Even if you've got a boot pants, just do it. <laughs> if, if, if you like her walking around, um, you know, the house with a lingerie, whatever the case may be, I do not know what's going on in your home. Let you do it then. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, couples now. I'm married couples, obviously. But, but this, is, this is also a relationship tool, a self-help tool, where you, you instruct people how to better their own um, relationships. Now, that was, in a nutshell, the IRM. In, I'm, I'm sorry, it's the intentional relationship method. I was wrong. That's why I, I thought about something earlier, and I couldn't remember what it was. I want to discuss with you the intentional relationship method. That's what this method is about. You can go and Google it. You can also find some, some nice stuff on the intentional relationship. You're intentionally making a difference in your relationship. That's that for tonight. I just want to come to a close, um, if you don't mind. I will allow some questions to be asked. But there, um, you know, the form I told you about is this one. I, I showed it to you before. In uh, Identify relevant symptoms you currently deal with. Now, before they come to you, they have to fill in this form, and they'll just identify some of the things they've been going through. I've sent it to you before on, on, on this chat. Um, if you still need it, you can just um, email me, and I'll, I will gladly send it to you. Okay, so um, if, if, if um, social isolation and wanting to be alone is an issue, you mark that. Alcohol and drugs is your issue, you mark that. And obviously, when the counselee comes to you, you'll know what is the issues they're dealing with. That is breaking every part down of the, um, the system that is broken at this stage. Now, many people, uh, maybe you have been wondering what TP stands for, and that is term paper. That is term paper, okay. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you cannot see what I'm, I'm seeing there. Um, there you go. Uh, you don't know what TP, well, on your final test, it, uh, on your final paper, it will say term paper, TP, or CP, class point attendance. In other words, for people that miss class, they will obviously get a minus uh, for every class they miss. For example, if we have four classes in this month and you have attended only three, you obviously um, will have 75% class attendance. And then for exam, you got another 75. So if you, if you calculate 75 plus 75% plus your term paper, say again, 80%, let's break it down 100%. I mean, come on, let's be... Good, you know, and then it means that you've got 200 and um, over 75, 75, so 100 of paper. Oh, yeah, 250, yes. So divide that by 300, and then obviously you'll have a pass rate. So even some people have missed class attendance, they've, they, they can still pass, but this will probably push you away from your, um, your 90%, which you want as an alumni student at the end of your course. So, um, so yes, that in a nutshell, but so, so please remember that um, I'll be sending out some exams during the course of this week. I've already got the exam up here. Let me real quick show you the exam um, just to show so that I can highlight it to you, to you again. Where is the exam now? I do not want to give you the complete one, but I will, I will just show you in a, a, a little insert from it. Um, here we go. All right, so it looks like this again. Um, you have a couple of questions. Um, this is the test. Um, let me just do this. <clears throat> so it will ask you, you know, to, to write. Well, in my case, my email is being used. Your name, your surname, and stuff like your, your monkey, monkey puzzle and so on. The words that's missing, you have to fill it in. And, and yeah, so, so you'll just work through it. And um, it's not difficult, really. It's not. It's really easy. Um, it's a 100-point questionnaire. Um, just 100 points. It's not so so awful. Um, I guess most of you would, again, get 100% for your assessments um, this week. If you need more time than the, the, the five, the fifth, between the 5th and uh, 10th of December, you can um, require more time, no problem. But I'll need to have your, um, before we close for December break, the 13th of December, we're going to close with our last session. I would, would like to have your your paper for this month, as well as your um, um, your test, please. Okay. Thank you very much for tonight. Is there any questions? Uh, 
No questions then. Are you tired? Do you want to go to bed, Pastor Doug? I think so. I think so. Time to <laughs> sleep. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. If, if if you don't know, Pastor Doug is early, but he wakes up like Yaku um, very early in the morning to go to gym. I get up early, but not to go to gym, you know, go to work. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, may the Lord bless you all. And then I'll, I'll chat to you on, some of you are in the third level training. So some of you I'll see tomorrow and Thursday. But for the others, I'll see you on Monday coming. May the Lord bless you all. God bless. Good evening, Pastor, and the rest of the people. Good night. Good night.